Hello, and welcome to the video accompanying Lecture 17. Here we're going to cover sections 7.4 and 7.7. .7. This is the second video for Chapter 7. In the first video and the first lecture notes, I talked about the definition of work. We looked at some specific examples that bridged the ideas from free body diagrams and using Newton's laws to talking about energy, specifically work and work's ability to create kinetic energy with the work kinetic, kinetic energy theorem. Those ideas are still going to apply to this lecture, but in this shorter lecture, we're going to take a more general, sometimes calculus perspective on work, rather than the more specific free body perspective you saw in the first chapter or first lecture. Now, that said, this content isn't, isn't necessarily more difficult, but it's just taking a more general view of work. Okay? So, the motivation of taking this more general view is to talk about forces that do not remain constant with distance, okay? And we call this a varying force. I also sometimes call it a variable force in the table below, but it's probably better to call it a varying force. Now, a varying force is interesting because it's, it's different than a non-constant force. So a non-constant force would be a force that is not constant in time. That's one where you know you have a time-dependent force, maybe a, maybe because of, you know and resulting in a time-dependent acceleration. Okay, we've seen that before, but we ha we haven't seen before is that are forces that are functions of distance. All right, so this is a force that is a function of well displacement really. All right. So that's a different functional dependence than time, obviously, right? So this is a force that's a function of x rather than of t, all right? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And the reason we're going to talk about it is because work and its definition is very well suited to handling such forces, okay? And we're also going to introduce something called a non-conservative force in the key term section of the notes, all right? It won't show up much, uh, much else in the notes, but we'll see it later on in the chapter. So let's get to the key terms, okay? So first of all, we have Hooke's Law. I'm actually going to redefine this in the next lecture, but since it applies to both lectures, I'll put the definition here first. This is the law for ideal springs. Ideal, well, you see a lot of ideal things in an introductory physics class. It's basically a massless spring that has no friction, but it's all the springs we care about, all right? So we can think of it as the law that applies to springs. It's really the one law we need to know when we're talking about perfect or ideal springs, all right? What it tells us is that there's a linear relationship between force applied to a spring and the distance of extension or compression, all right? So that's, it just says there's a linear, linearity, a proportion between them, and since there's a linear relationship, there ends up being a proportionality constant, all right? But we'll talk about that. And again, you know, you can, you can see this again in the next lecture, okay? Um, that proportionality constant is called the spring constant. It is the slope of the linear relationship between force and the spring and the change in length of that spring. The spring force is the restoring force of the spring when we talk about spring force. So if I push on a spring by Newton's third law, that spring must push back with an equal magnitude force opposite in direction. And that pushback from the spring is the restoring force. It's a reaction force to the external force acting on the spring from, say, me pushing on the spring. Okay? All right. So that, that's springs, right? Now, the reason we're talking about springs is springs create varying forces. Okay, so we're going to see this in the key, the key formulas, and it's going to be the really necessitate the approach that we're going to take to defining work in this lecture. Now, that's, you know, I want to make this clear that we could have done everything in the previous lecture with this, this full calculus-based dot product definition of work. We just didn't need it, right? Because before, in the last lecture, it was all about saying, oh, well, work is force times distance times cosine of the angle between the two, right? Phi was just between f as a vector and d. Simple as that, okay? But where does that come from? That, of course, comes from the dot product. And you may have recognized it as such. If you didn't, that's okay too. But that's, that's where that magnitude times magnitude times cosine of the angle between the two, that's the magnitude of a dot product, okay? All right. But let's, let's define a non-conservative force before I get ahead of myself. All right. So non-conservative force, forces and path dependence. Well, first of all, all non-conservative forces are path dependent. Okay, that's great, but that doesn't define either of them, right? So what are they? Well, a path-dependent force is a force where the distance rather than the displacement is used to calculate work. 
right? So for gravity, it's the displacement. It doesn't matter how you get from point A to point B. It just matters what the, dis what the, the displacement is, and specifically the vertical displacement, or at least the displacement that's parallel to the direction of the force, and gravity happens to point downwards. That's why it's the vertical displacement that matters, okay? So gravity would be a path-independent force. All right. In fact, any of the field forces, including the ones you, that you'll learn about in electricity and magnetism, would all be path independent. Okay. A path dependent force is one where if you wind around to get from point A to point B, that matters. Well, what kind of force acts like that? Friction. Okay. And so does drag. Okay. You know, drag with its it's weird, you know, what we, what we recently learned about. It's weird proportionality to velocity, right? But still, it's also path dependent on top of that, right? So if you take a winding path, you're going to experience more drag, all right? In, you know, in addition to the fact that it's proportional to how fast you take that winding path, all right? So, of course, drag is complicated. And I think I, have, I came up with a good table here to sum up the ideas. So basically, these are the forces we've seen so far. Gravity, friction, drag, and now, the new one, spring, Okay. All right, so what is gravity? Well, it's a conservative force because it doesn't... So, okay, first of all, it's a conservative force and it's path independent. But what does conservative mean? Well, we'll learn more about that in the next lecture um, or more specifically in the lecture after the next lecture and even more so in the next chapter because energy is kind of spread out over two chapters in your book. So we'll be talking about it for a while. But I'll give you the kind of the, the, quick, the quick idea here with hopefully the assurance that we're going to talk about this a lot more. So this will not be the last time. A conservative force is a force that conserves mechanical energy. So essentially it keeps the system entirely mechanical without creating any heat. So you can think of conservative as being a force that doesn't generate any heat. Okay? It doesn't generate, you know, that kind of, you know, random noise type of energy that, that is associated with heat. Okay? So friction obviously creates heat, so it's a non-conservative force. It takes away mechanical energy, a term we have yet to define, but we'll talk about mechanical energy, energy soon. All right, I'll just run down the column here. Drag is non-conservative, and you might not associate drag as creating heat, but turbulence and the sound that's associated with drag, those are all very similar types of energies to heat. They're all, they're all essentially stochastic or random processes, and they might as well be heat, because ultimately heat is the average kinetic energy of particles, so is you know, the random motion that's created with drag. All right, so it's definitely non-conservative, it's taking away mechanical energy, it's creating turbulence, heat, sound energy, all of that, okay? A spring, by the way, an ideal spring, is a purely mechanical system because there's no friction. It's just storing the energy in this, in this purely mechanical system. So it's kind of interesting. A sp an ideal spring is, first of all, a bit of a fiction, right? I mean, I, I suppose a frictionless ramp is as well. But regardless, it is, it's an interesting idea that the, the spring is capable of storing, say, gravitational energy perfectly, right? And then it can convert that energy back to kinetic energy. And we've talked about the work done by gravity. We've talked about the work, um, you know, and we're going to talk about the work done by a spring. And we've already talked about kinetic energy. That idea of stored energy, which has the term potential energy, you have to wait for the very next lecture for that. that that's where I'm going to formally define potential energy and do a bunch of examples of it, including springs. So we're going to see a bunch of springs in this lecture and the next one. All right. So you can tell, like, the material crosses over a lot. There's no one way to you know, say, oh, I'm just going to compartmentalize this idea. We have to have crossovers between them, okay? All right, but then in the next column, path dependent or path independent, well, we can see every force that's conservative is path independent, and every force that's non-conservative is path dependent. And the reason, the kind of the, the behind-the-scenes reason for that is because forces that, that care about the path you take, like friction and drag, are forces that create heat. Because the very idea of caring about the path means that you're caring about all those molecular interactions along the path which means you're losing mechanical energy, okay? And then a spring, being conservative, is path independent. It doesn't matter how you compress the spring, it just matters that you compress the spring. That said, springs are a bit of a cheat because springs are basically 1D systems. You can't like compress a spring, at least in our, our problems, in the way that we approach problems and make simplifications, you can't like bend a spring as you compress it. They just either they compress straight down or they stretch straight, okay? All right, and this last one, this, this last column is an interesting one. Because this is really going to apply to the approach we're going to take in this lecture and the way we're going to use the dot product and, the, and an integral to talk about the total work done. And that's whether a force is constant or varying. Although here I call it variable, but you can, I'm using that as a synonym. So think when I variable, varying, the point is that variable here means a function of distance. So force for, you know, for F and then as a function of X. 
Okay, that's the idea. That, that's what variable or varying means. So first of all, gravity is constant. Okay, gravity is constant. The, the gravitational force doesn't vary. You know, now that is for small heights. We'll actually break that rule in one of our chapters. We'll talk about gravity for large height differences. You know, like what if I go to the moon? Well, then gravity, gravitational strength definitely does vary. But for now, we're, you know, we're sticking um, to within, let's say, 5,000 meters of the Earth's surface, which is well within 1% error of making that assumption. So we're good to go. Okay. So for us, gravity is constant for now. Okay. Friction is constant. Usually, you could define friction to be non-constant. I could give you some friction function. But for, you know, for 99% of problems, if we're to, if you're, and every time you're given a friction coefficient, then you assume that friction is just defined as that friction coefficient, say, kinetic times the normal force, and that's definitely a constant value. Okay? All right. Drag, on the other hand, is totally variable. All right, so if I wanted to find the work done by drag, I would have to use the dot product integral definition that you're just about to see. Definitely, definitely. It actually ends up being very difficult to calculate. In many cases, you can't actually solve the integrals. All right, so, you know, just, I mean, it'll, especially for Newtonian drag, um, but regardless, it is a variable force, all right? Now, the one that we can solve rather easily that we can then, we can really use um, the math we we're about to introduce is a spring, because a spring is a variable force. And uh, you know you see that in the key equations, but the, the explanation I want to give you now before I, before, I flip, before I flip the page here is that the reason the spring is a varying force, a variable force, is that the more you push on a spring, the more it pushes back. So that you know if you think about it, right? It's easy. It's easier to compress it the first little bit than to continue to compress that spring. All right? Because eventually you get to a point where the spring is, is pushing back so much that you can't continue to compress it, right? So it's not like it, it it's it remains equal pushback the whole time. I mean, that's common sense. We all know that about springs, okay? So it's definitely a variable force. It's a force that depends on how much you stretch or compress the spring, okay? And it's linear, okay? Because we mentioned that up above, right? It's a linear idea. All right, so let's see those equations. Okay, so the place we're gonna start, and this is a really important one, definitely, definitely kind of the thing, kind of the backbone of the whole idea here is this definition right here. This is the general definition of work, okay? At least for 1D. And what is it showing us? Well, it's showing us that work is the integral of the dot product of force and displacement. Okay, now it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, okay? But it's the integral of the dot product of force and displacement. So in other words, let's think about what's going on side the integral. This is a dot product. Well, the dot product is telling us that the only non-zero part of this dot product is the part of force that's parallel to the displacement, all right? Because the part of force that's perpendicular to the displacement doesn't show up in a dot product. The dot product only lets survive, by the way it works mathematically, the parallel part. So if I dot the, for the force vector and the displacement vector, you know, the x vector, then I'm just going to get the component of the force that's parallel to x, all right? Or you could think of getting the component of x that's parallel to f. But either way, right, that's, it's, you're going to get only the parallel components, all right? Then when you integrate, that means you're just finding the area under the curve of force as a function of distance. So if I have some function, right, force and distance, and you know, this is my function form, then my area under the curve, well, that's the, that's the integral. And that area under the curve would have units of, well, height times width, so Newton seconds, because the height was, vertical axis was in, was in force, which was Newtons, horizontal axis was in distance, which was meters. So Newton meters, right? What are Newton meters? They're the units of work, okay? Which we, of course, can also express as joules. So it makes sense that integrating force times distance gives us work. Okay? Absolutely. And the reason we would integrate it is because it's non-constant. Right? If the force is constant, then I just have a rectangle and then I can just multiply f times x. Okay? And specifically, here's my force axis in newtons, here's my horizontal axis in meters, all right? And I go like this and then so I can just multiply and it would be the component of x or the component of f that's parallel to x, hence the subscript x, times the height x, okay? Or actually times the height fx. But still, you know, that's, that's what we've done up to this point, okay? So it's, it's just the more formal idea of what we've already been doing, all right? When it was constant, it just became multiplication, but now it's non-constant, it has to become integration, and we're just showing the fact that the dot product was the reason that it was f times d times cosine of phi, phi being the angle between the two, okay? And this is just pointing that out, that that in inside of the um, in the inside of the integral is just the dot product, and the dot product 
is just going to be this, okay? And this is really being arrow because I'm just focusing on what's inside of the integral rather than saying that this is equal to the integral, okay? Okay, right? And this would be, um, and this would also be, you could, you could also say this is equal if f is constant, which we saw before. And I think I actually meant to write that. So that would apply for, you know, if f is constant, then you could say that that integral is equal, essentially drop, drop the, um, the limits of integration because it just becomes multiplication. And then you just still have the dot product, take care of the dot product with the angle. Okay? All right. But when it's not constant, then we actually have to do the integral. And we will do that in this very lecture. Okay? And what about when it's three-dimensional? All right. And this is just pointing out that in the previous lecture, you saw that the displacement vector was d, right, as a vector. But we could also call that delta x. Same idea, just different terms for the same thing. All right? And this is for forces that are not functions of x, non-varying forces. That's, the, that, that's right. I forgot I had written it. Excuse me. Right, so that, that this equation right here, this equality, would only be true if it was non-varying, okay? Right, which we've seen before. Okay, now, what if it's 3D, okay? Well, the 3D definition of work looks like this. Now, I could have, I could have written this as the dot product, so I could have had, you know, force as a function of x, y, and z dotted with dx. Well, when I do that, it just becomes fx dx, because it's only the component that's parallel to dx that survives. Likewise, this one right here, would be force as a function of x, y, and z as a vector dotted with dz as a vector. Well, what does that become when you actually do the dot product? Fy dz, because it's only the parallel component, or Fy dy, excuse me. It only, it's only the component of the force that's, that's parallel to dy that survives, right? So that's the thing about taking a 3D force vector and finding the work done by that 3D force vector is you only have to, it's kind of nice, you only have to care about the components of force that are parallel to each of the displacements each of the axes. And then if you want to find the work, the total amount of work, because let's say that each of these is a function, right? You know, maybe one of them is constant, but maybe fy is a function of y. Maybe fz is a function of z. Well, then you actually just want to integrate it, right? By following whatever rules of integration or any antiderivatives you need to do, okay? All right. And as I point out, this is indeed from the dot product because the part that's not parallel does not survive. Okay, so that's, this is all general ideas for work. This could apply to every single time we talk about work, okay? But sometimes we want shortcuts. So let's talk about shortcuts for springs, right here. These equations only apply to springs. All right, and let's see why. Okay, so the first one is the spring force. That's what the little subscript S stands for, okay? It's a vector, it's a force. And the spring force by definition is equal to negative kx. Why? Because that's Hooke's law. That's just an empirical law. It's an observation that for ideal springs, you push on them, and the push grows linearly. And well, the push back grows linearly. K is the spring constant. It tells you how much that spring resists having its length changed. So a spring constant that's really high is a really stiff spring. A spring constant that's low is a not very stiff spring. It's a loose spring. Spring constants can vary from 10 Newton per, uh, Newton per meter, because the units are always going to be Newton per meter. Um, or to the thousands of newtons per meter if they're very stiff, okay? And we always represent them by the letter K, all right? X is the change in length of the spring, either a compression or a lengthening, okay? So this is it. This is just Hooke's law. It's an empirical observation like all laws, okay? But, you know, it's not perfect. There's no such thing as a truly ideal spring, but it does apply really well to mini springs, okay? An interesting thing about the spring constant is it's totally individual. It's determined by like the geometry and the density and the materials of the spring. And so every spring has its own spring constant, okay? Well, then what we can do is we can take Hooke's law, put it in as our variable force, because look, that is definitely a variable force, plug it into the integral and then find work. And it ends up being this. This is, ends up being the work done by a spring. Well, you don't believe it? Check it out. Here it is, putting it in, inside the integral, the very same one-dimensional one that's up there, because springs are 1D after all, right? The spring force is negative kx. I'm gonna go ahead and do the antiderivative, and it becomes negative one-half kx squared. I'm gonna evaluate the upper limit and the lower limit, x final and x initial, respectively. And then notice, right, then I got the upper limit becomes negative one-half kx, x final squared, minus the lower limit, which is minus a negative, one-half k initial squared, which is why the one-half k x initial squared is first. Because we're usually used to a, a difference. I mean, think like, you know, delta k, which we saw before, it was one-half mv final squared minus one-half mv initial squared. So the final came first, because we're looking for the final minus the initial. You know, we're also doing final minus initial, but because it's a negative force, then the work 
ends up the negative, you know, gets distributed in such a way that the initial comes first when we write it. You know, of course, we could write it like this, right? You know, with the negative, with the negative inside of the, you know, with undistributed. But I think it's nice to distribute the negative. Okay. So this is the work done by a spring. Now, if we wanted to, I'll just kind of jump down and point out. If we wanted to talk about the work done on a spring, it would just be the negative of that. Okay. And that would be for compressing springs that have a final state at rest. To say that the work applied to a spring is equal to the negative of the work done by the spring. Because that's only true if work net equals zero, right? Now, you may have forgotten, but that's the, that's the work kinetic energy theorem. Because that's only, so you can only say that these two works are equal to each other and opposite inside if there's no change in kinetic energy. So this is compressing a spring, but not having it move afterwards. Compressing it and then kind of having it be at rest. Maybe, you know, say I have a maximum compressive state. Or stretching it and then stretching it until it's at rest. Okay? Which is what you do a lot with springs. All right, let's do some examples. So I got three types of problems here. Problems that um, involve a one-dimensional varying force from a Hookean spring, which is one that follows Hooke's law. We call them a Hookean spring. Type two, fairly complex problems that involve a one-dimensional varying force of any form, so not necessarily springs. And then finally, the 3D ones. So three-dimensional problems for you know, some, some random force that I give you. Okay? So those are the three types of problems you're going to see. And, you can kind of, and they all kind of have slightly different um, solution methods. Okay? All right. So let's do the first one. A Hookean spring. An air track glider of mass 100 kilograms or 0.1, 100 grams or 0.1 kilograms is attached to the end of a horizontal air track by a spring with a force constant of 285 newtons per meter. There's our K value. Initially, the spring is unstretched and the glider is at rest. How much work does it take to move the glider 12 centimeters to the right? Right? So we're stretching it. Um, okay. So that's our first question. Let's see. Well, we're going to have work applied equals one half kx squared. Okay, we know we could get that from the integral, but we don't need to, right? Because we can just, you know, just always use this for ideal springs. You don't have to rederive it every time, right? But it just comes from this. All right, and then we'll just plug in our spring constant we're given, and we'll plug in our displacement of 12 centimeters converted to meters, and we find out that it would take about a, you know, 15% of a joule, 0.144 joules. Okay, all right. So that's how much work it takes to stretch the spring 12 centimeters. Interesting. Okay, not a lot, right? But it's not. It's, you know, it's, it's not that much of a stretch, right? And our spring constant isn't that large as far as spring constants go. Okay. What if we apply, however, what if we apply um, 50 joules of work? Okay. So this is a lot more. I'm trying to remember why. Yeah, anyway. So here we're applying 50 joules. 50 joules is the same as 50 newton meters, right? Those are interchangeable units. And we're going to set it equal to 1 half kx squared because this is the work done on the spring. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and solve for x, okay? And I think actually I didn't update this value. I think that number is wrong because I'd had a different number for the spring constant. And I think I, I put the new number in, but I forgot to recalculate it because I know this one's right. I just, I just rewrote this one. This one I believe is a typo. So go ahead and look at the updated notes and you're going to see that there should be a much larger number in here because it would make no sense that it takes, um, that you get, um, you know, for example, that for it to get 12 centimeters of stretch, it takes less, you know, well less than one joule. And then if we put in, you know, a whopping like almost 500 times as much energy, right? Look at that. That's almost 500 times as much energy. And then somehow it only stretches 59 centimeters. I mean, it's true that it takes more and more energy the more you stretch it, but not that much more. All right. And so I think that, you know, the numbers are correct here, but I forgot to update the answer. Okay. So take note of that. Look, look at the correct answer in the notes. Okay, and then, okay, so continuing on with part B, because we're asked, okay, so 50 newtons of work is applied to the glider, to move it to the right, okay, so we're stretching it still. What is the acceleration once it's released? Okay, so how would we find that? Well, now that we know the stretch, so look, look what we did here. We used up energy, external energy, set it equal to the work done by the spring, or the work done on the spring in this case, to find out the stretch. Once we found the stretch, we then used Hooke's law to find the force, okay? So I find that it's 169 newtons of force to stretch it this much for this particular spring with this spring constant, okay? And applying that particular amount of energy, okay? So when you do that, then by the time, you know, it's, that's the final force. The kind of like, once you pull it to 59 centimeters and you're holding it at that, that stretch, that's how much force it takes to hold it at that, that point. It would, it would have taken less force to hold it at lesser distances, okay? So here you are holding it, you know, stretched out almost 60 centimeters. You're holding it with 169 newtons of force, and then you release it. The moment you release it, how much does it accelerate? Well, that depends on what's attached to it, 
In this case, only 100 grams is attached, so the accelerations would be large. And it's just going to be F over M, or 169 divided by 0.1, which is 1,690 meters per second squared. So huge acceleration, right, initially. But that acceleration will fall off as the spring moves back, okay? Okay, because that acceleration is definitely non-constant because the force is non-constant, all right? And we don't know it as a function of time, but we would know the acceleration as a function of distance, just like we know the force as a function of distance, function of x, right? And x is measured this way, okay? All right, so that's part B, found the acceleration by using energy and relating it to the work done on the spring, okay? And this, this is the correct value, by the way. The only error is in part A. All right, in part C, how fast would the glider be traveling when it is three centimeters to the right of equilibrium? Well, the idea here is we're gonna use the work kinetic energy theorem. So again, throw back to the previous lecture, but an important one, the work kinetic energy theorem doesn't go away, right? It's actually very useful. We're kind of gonna relabel it as conservation of mechanical energy um, in a bit, but for now, it's definitely something that could come up in any one of the problems in this chapter, okay? So here we have the work done by the spring equals the change in the kinetic energy, 50 joules of work, and then we've got our change in kinetic energy. Notice here I have the change in kinetic energy because the initial kinetic energy would be zero, so it's one half mv squared final. And then I've got this other term that isn't a kinetic energy term. What is that? Well, this is the leftover work. This is the remaining work, okay? Remaining work for the spring to do, okay? We'll learn very soon that we could also think of that as the remaining potential energy that the spring possesses. But for now, it's the, re the remaining work that the spring is capable of doing, okay? because work creates kinetic energy, right? That's how, it's how you define work. All right, so then we see there's only one unknown, V final, we go ahead and solve for it, and we get 31.6 meters per second, all right? That's how fast it's going when it's moved from its initial distance of 59 centimeters from equilibrium to just three centimeters from equilibrium. So it's almost, so it started off over here, it accelerated all the way, not at the constant acceleration, but then it reaches this point where it's almost back at, at equilibrium and it's moving pretty fast. Okay? This is almost as fast as it was moving. because We can show later on that the fastest point is when it returns to where it would have been at rest before. At, and that, at that moment, it has momentarily zero acceleration because its force would momentarily zero, be zero because its distance from its natural length is zero. And so at that point, its velocity would be greatest and it would be a little bit greater than this. Okay? All right. So cool. A lot of ideas there. Now let's do it again. But that this time, let's do it for a non-Hookean spring. So the only, the, whole, the only difference here is I'm calling it a rubber band and it's, we can't just use the prefabricated, you know, the one half kx squared, which of course came from the integral definition. Instead, we have to go back to the integral and define a new work function. All right, so let's see what that looks like. So we have the work applied equals negative the work done on the spring. All right, so the work applied then is gonna be negative of the force acting uh, or the force from the spring times the displacement. We know that the force from the spring because we're told here, this, this is the restoring force, and we're given the restoring force. The reason I'm really careful to pay attention to the negatives is since we're given this restoring force, and then we're asked about applying work on the spring, we have to remember we need to take the negative of whatever force we were given, okay? All right, so that's what I'm doing here. And then I just plug in the form, all right? And so this is the form of the restoring force of the spring. Okay, so this first part, it makes sense as negative. It's weird the second term is positive, but I'll explain that, okay? The reason that we have a positive term is it's supposed to represent the rubber band failing as it gets overstretched. Now this term only makes physical sense when it's smaller than the negative term, because it doesn't make sense for a spring to start delivering energy or you know, doing work. The spring can only oppose the extension or compression, or the rubber band can only oppose being stretched. All right, so that's why it's negative here, that makes sense. But to have this part that, you know, that's growing up to a point does make sense. You just have to be careful about what the limits of these values are to keep it making physical sense. Right? So it's a model, right? It would just be an approximation model that someone could come up with that would describe the behavior of a rubber band. And it's somewhat realistic, okay? All right, and this cosine theta just comes from the dot product because the, um, because the forces are parallel to each other, okay? The, or in other words, the external force acting on the rubber band is parallel to the displacement, hence cosine of zero degrees, all right? All right, so then we just plug in our form of our force function. All right, I plug in the values. Um, in the original printed version, I had, um, again, I had some um, issues with the, the magnitudes, which is why you saw I, uh, something I had not corrected on the previous problem. And so I had this written as six, but it should be 600. And this one is written as two, but it should be 200. So I corrected them here. So you can see that they're corrected. Likewise, in part B, it was written as 50, but it should have been five. Right? Otherwise, the numbers just become ridiculous. Okay, and so here, all, I, all I'm doing is I'm just plugging in, I evaluated the integral, 
As I did that, I just followed the rules of uh, any derivatives for polynomials. So my x, my x went from three halves to five halves, then I divided by that five half. My x squared went um, to x cubed, then I divided by three. Right, the, the coefficients of alpha being 600 and beta being 200 are just kind of long for the ride. I still have my negative, I haven't distributed my other negative in yet. And then I just have my, um, my limits. I'm going from zero to 12 centimeters because I'm stretching it 12 centimeters, okay? As we can see, uh, where's it's, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, 12 centimeters, okay? Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and evaluate this, right, this function at the, um, the upper and the lower limit. When I evaluate the lower limit, since it's a polynomial, nothing happens, there's just gonna be all zeros. So I only care about just plugging in 12. So if I go ahead and do that and just plug in 12, I get 1.08 Newton meters, right? All, and literally all I've done is just distribute the negative and plug in 12 every time there's an x. Well, 0.12, okay? So there we have it in units of Newton meters, 1.08, okay? And we can also put that in units of joules. Okay, so that's part A. And again, that was just how much work it would take to stretch this particular rubber band, well, 12 centimeters, all right? Takes about, about a joule. Okay, so then if five joules instead, five Newton meters of work is applied, so about five times as much, then how much is the, how much is the spring gonna stretch? Which we'll need to find because then we're asked the same kind of question we were asked in example one, what is the acceleration when we release it? But if, of course we need to find the stretch, then we need to find the force, and then we can find the acceleration. So it's a three-step process, okay? So we use the work applied function all right, so all I've done here is just clean this up a little bit. I distribute the negative. I took the 600 and divided by five halves and so on. So here is my work applied function for this particular rubber band. Then I'm going to plug in a particular value of five and then I need to solve this for x. Now this is not something you can just solve for x using you know, the quadratic because we've got you know, weird orders on our polynomials and, and first of all, we have a cubic. So we need to basically graph it or use some computer algebra system to solve it. I say here graphically. And then there's your solution, 0.225 meters. Now there's another positive solution, but you have to actually reject the larger positive solution because it doesn't make physical sense. And why not? Because it's past the point that this positive value doesn't, doesn't represent the string getting, or the spring or the rubber band getting overstretched, but somehow starts to represent the total nonsensical idea of the rubber band like being like some source of energy and doing work on the external environment, which is impossible. Okay, but again, that's just the limitation of this model of a rubber band. Okay, but we, we, but we do accept the distance that does make sense. All right, and, and this is a good reality check because that's 22 centimeters. So that makes sense. It's a little bit bigger. Now you might think, well, wait, but it's, it's, only, it's only about twice as big as 12, but it's, but it's almost five times the energy. Well, that's because the force isn't constant. Okay, so we shouldn't expect it to be linear. It's definitely not linear. All right, so then now that we have um, our x, then we can just find acceleration. We're gonna use Hooke's law, so it's just gonna be, um, just gonna be f, all right? Um, well, it's not really Hooke's law, sorry. It's just, it's the spring force, right? This is, our, this, is, this is our force vector, okay? And we're just gonna divide that by m, right? Plug in our particular distance that we found, all right? And I'm taking the magnitude because I only care about the magnitude of acceleration. I mean, otherwise it's gonna give me a negative acceleration, but I didn't really define the coordinate system. So I'm just gonna find the magnitude of acceleration, and again, it's very large because this is a actually really, really stretched rubber band. <laughs> this rubber band would probably fail before you could stretch it that much. Okay, all right. So same idea as in example one, but with a function that isn't just kx. Okay, all right. Now let's go back to an ideal spring, um, just to uh, mix it up a little bit. Um, the only reason I'm going back to the simpler type of type one problems is just to do it in a vertical sense because a lot of springs, it's not a pushing force, but instead it's the force of gravity by hanging something on the spring. So I just wanted to show what that looked like. We're just gonna go through this one quickly. An ideal spring is hung vertically from the ceiling. A two kilogram block hangs, um, hangs at rest from the spring, um, which extends at six centimeters from its relaxed length. Um, an upward external force is then applied to the block to move it upward a distance of 16 centimeters. While the block is moving upward, the work done by the spring is what? If the external force is then removed, what will be the maximum speed of the block? All right, so that's the idea, right? We have its previous equilibrium. That would have been the natural length of the spring. Once we attach the block, it stretches it down six centimeters. That's its current equilibrium. Then we're gonna apply an external force to push it back well past its previous equilibrium up into its compressive range. And then we're gonna release it, all right? So what is that gonna look like? Well, we've got Hooke's law right here, all right? So it's negative of the force applied equals negative kx, so the negatives cancel out. Um, and our force applied is going to be mg, all right? and then you have kx, so that means that k is just mg over x, okay? So that's great because look, that means that that, that information we're given about the fact that 
um, it stretched six centimeters when a two kilogram block was hung, hung from it, allowed us to solve for the spring constant. And that's a really common thing when you work with springs, is you're given some, some weight and then you're told how much that affects the spring and you're supposed to use that to find the spring constant, often as a first step to do something else. And you're gonna see that a lot in the next lecture as well. Okay, and so then we find our spring constant to be 330 newtons per meter. And then we're gonna go on and say that the spring starts at equilibrium and then compresses 16 centimeters. All right, so that means the work done by the spring is gonna be zero because the, um, the initial state is zero. Because remember, this is a one half kx initial squared, okay? And then minus one half kx final squared, all right, okay? And so then we'll just plug in what we know. We know k now, and we're given the compress compressive distance of 16. And so then we find that the work done by the spring, of course, is negative because it's opposing the displacement. And, or you can think of it, it's, of course, the work is negative because the, um, the force of the spring acts at 180 degrees to the displacement, all right? And so what, for whatever you know, logic you take, it has to be negative, and it's negative 4.22 Newton meters, or joules, okay? And to find V max, we're gonna use the work, uh, the work kinetic energy theorem. So the work done by the spring is this equal to one half mv squared. Go ahead and solve for V. All right, and what do we get? 2.05 meters per second, okay? And again, that's just using the fact that the work done by the spring, or, or once that work is released, once, once the, or, or even think of it as once the work, once the spring does work on the external world, that manifests itself in the kinetic energy of the attached block, okay? And it depends how, how sluggish the block is, that's why its own inertia shows up. And then we just plug everything in, okay? Yeah, there's our max speed, all right? And that max speed would occur when it returns to equilibrium. So the max speed would, would occur right there, okay? Because at that point, it's, there's, no, it, 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 there's no acceleration acting on it, so it has to be the, the point where it's momentarily um, moving at constant velocity, and that constant velocity is the greatest velocity it's ever gonna have. Because afterwards, you know, as, it, as, then it, as it continues on, it's gonna start slowing down, because at that point, the spring force is gonna oppose its continued downward motion, and it will just oscillate back and forth forever, okay? All right, in the absence of any uh, non-conservative forces. All right, let's do um, a simple interpretation of a figure here. Here we have acceleration and displacement. So the area under an acceleration, well, let's think about that, right? So that's gonna be, right? Well, if I just take acceleration times x, that doesn't give me units of anything that, that is that helpful. But if I take m into account, then I get mass times acceleration times x, or mass times acceleration times distance. Well, if you remember, that was work. Work is mass times acceleration times distance, right? Work is mad. I, that was in the previous lecture. And so that means that the area under this curve has to be the work, okay? And so then if we wanna find um, how much work the force does going from zero to four, that's gonna be all positive work. And it's just gonna be the area under this curve, just a rectangle and two triangles added together. And it ends up being 232 Newton meters. And then if we look at part B, that's gonna be the work going from zero to eight. Well, the first bit is positive. This bit's negative, so we have to subtract it. So we take the value from the first part, the 20.4, 20, 20 before we multiply by the mass. So this is just acceleration times distance, okay? But then we subtract the acceleration times distance that's happening in this segment to get the net work, and it's 66.3 newtons, newton meters, okay? And the idea here is you can get those values from an acceleration versus distance graph like this, okay? All right. Okay, so our final two examples are the 3D type. Now these ones aren't particularly hard, uh, and these 3D work problems can be a little bit, a little bit trickier, um, but I think these ones are pretty straightforward. Um, you know, they maybe they look look daunting because they got high, i hat, j hat, and k hat, but the the the, the procedure is really straightforward. We just plug them into the formula, um, and then you know do some simple um, antiderivatives, evaluate the limits, and we're done. Okay, so what does it look like? Well, we just take our definition of work in 3D. All right, here is um, we know we have a function with an f(x), an f(y), and an f(z). Um, you know, components of that force. And so that's what we're just gonna plug in to our form. I went ahead and plugged in the limits because we're told that we're moving from a particular coordinate to a final coordinate. So our, our, these, this is just our, all our initial values and this is just all our final values. And you can just see that by looking at the coordinates in X, Y, and Z. All right, so then let's plug in our numbers. Um, and I do kind of two steps in one here. I actually plug in the numbers and do the antiderivative all at once. Not sure why, but you know, so I hope you can forgive me for it. But anyway, so you know, because here we had X cubed, when I do the antiderivative, it will become X to the fourth over four. This one here is just gonna become two x when I do the antiderivative. And then, then this one here will become 3.5 over three times z cubed, right? And we can see that in each case. 
okay? So the constant one becomes linear and then we go up one power on all the other ones. And then we're just going to show, I'm just showing here that I'm evaluating um, the lower limit and upper limit or upper limit minus the lower limit, right? You, hopefully you've seen this notation of evaluating limits. That's what that vertical bar means, all right? And then when I do that, well, okay, this, since this one has a lower, lower limit of zero, it's just a matter of plugging in the two. Four, four over four is of course one. You know, same sort of thing here, I just plug in the three. Here I actually have to consider both limits, so I do it a little bit more carefully. But then when I just do all my values, I didn't carry over the, um, the units here, it would have been joules, and then my final answer is in joules, okay? And you know, furthermore, in terms of the units, you know, I'm just, we have to assume you know, whatever is appropriate on these coefficients and assume that the units are not shown, okay? All right, let's do it again, but with, more, I guess, more interesting functions. In this case, we just have a two-dimensional force vector, except it has uh, uh, basically sinusoidal or cosinusoidal behavior in the x direction, and then it's got a three over y um, as the function in the j hat or the, the, y, the y direction. Okay, so x, sinusoidal, and then a uh, reciprocal function in the, uh, the y direction. Okay, the units are gonna be newtons, okay? So again, you know, we have to assume the coefficients make it work out. All right, it's applied along a displacement vector r that has a magnitude of 14 and points 35 degrees abo above the x-axis, and it starts at y, x equals one, y equals one. So how much work is done by the force over this displacement? All right, so first of all, I just have to find the, um, the length of that displacement vector. So these are the two components of the displacement vector. And then we're gonna evaluate from one to the length, the end, the end point based on those components. Essentially, you know, it's like we have some displacement vector r here. That's gonna give us some coordinate. And then we start at one, one over here, and then we're just finding the distance from this point to that point, okay? All right, and so when we do that, then we just plug in our functions, then we actually do the antiderivatives, all right? Our, our uh, cosine just becomes a negative sign, and then our three over y becomes a natural log. So yeah, a bit more interesting, definitely requires you to know some of the more, the more rules for, for solving integrals of common, common forms, all right? And plug in our numbers, uh, we're gonna evaluate both our, our upper and lower limit in both cases, okay? And we get 1.7 joules, okay? All right, well that brings this lecture to a close about kind of looking at work in the general sense, looking at applying to varying forces, and kind of, I think, just laying the groundwork for a lot of ideas. I know I kind of went off on a few tangents, but that's because we're so early in this two chapter exploration into work and energy that there's a lot of like, there's a lot of ideas that are just, just getting established. But we're gonna bring it all together, we're gonna start seeing more robust examples as we move forward, and hopefully all those pieces will come together and it'll make sense. So thank you so much for watching this lecture, and I will uh, see you all soon.